Hello, and welcome to Rome 2. Episode 2, Generals and Armies. Still, Turn 1, Winter of 278 BCE. As the name suggests, I'm going to review the generals that I have, and in particular, the General of Legio 2, as well as the army and the army composition. But before we get into that, I would like to recruit some agents. So in Rome, basically even the base game and this game, you have what are called agents, and you have a limited number of them. Those agents include spies, dignitaries, and champions. So we'll review those real quick as we recruit them. So the first thing we're going to do is recruit a spy. Spies are experts in subterfuge. They move unseen and improve security. They can inflict casualties against military targets, wreck supplies and buildings, steal enemy intelligence, and incite riots. So right now we have zero spies, and we can recruit one. So we're going to take a look at the three spies available here. We have Ulpia Severa, Genusia Ahala, and Pompeia Gamella. So just a quick look at their base effects leads me to believe that none of them are outstanding. So we're just going to recruit Ulpia Severa because she's got a cool name. Nice. So there's our first spy, Ulpia Severa. Next, we're going to recruit a dignitary. Dignitaries are respected pillars of society. They spread their cultural ideals and tend to military and civic administration. They can undermine enemy generals, hinder government and commerce, and incite provinces to rebel. So, we currently have zero, and we can recruit two. So the first one we're going to recruit is going to be Decimus Claudius Nepos. He gives us a base bonus of culture plus two cultural conversion, and that's a passive action. So bonus culture, especially as the Julii family, is always welcome because we need cultural conversion. Now we have two left to choose from, either Appius Socellius Megalus or Marcus Cacilius Scorus. And we are going to go with... Neither one of them is a standout. We're going to go with this one, though. Marcus Cacilius Scorus. His passive effects are plus 3% unit replenishment, plus 1 growth per turn in a local province, and plus 3% morale for all units in the local armies. And with that, we have recruited our one spy and our two dignitaries. Now, it's still called dignitaries here, but their actual name is a governor. So, those of you that can see the map here see that when I click Ulpia Severa, it says spy above her name. But when I click Decimus Claudius Nepos, it says governor. Same with Marcus Achilles Scorus. So, DEI kind of renamed them. Now, the way I'm going to use... Ulpia Severa, the spy, is she's basically just going to roam across the map and contact foreign nations. So I can set up, set up trade agreements. That's all she's going to do in the beginning. I'm currently only at war with the Etruscans to the north, and they'll be dealt with shortly. So we don't really need her to spy on our enemies. As for the two governors, I'm going to go deploy them in my home provinces of Latium and Magna Gratia, where they're going to administer. So we'll cover that next turn. The last unit, which I can't recruit any of, <clears throat> is the Champion. Champions are military veterans. They specialize in training troops and rousing military fervor. They can impair enemy combat ability, inflict casualties, raid settlements, and rally slave populations against their masters. Right now I can't recruit them because I haven't researched the tech called Barracks Construction, but they don't really perform a vital role. I basically just embed them in the army where they train my troops, so I get a passive amount of XP per turn. Helpful if you want a highly experienced army, but not worth it to research just yet. So that handles recruiting of the agents. The next thing I'm going to do is recruit two generals. So you can see I have Legio 1 down here near uh, Cosentia and Beneventum, halfway between them and Magna Gratia. And I have Legio 2 up here near Roma. Now, at my current level, I can have four armies total, and I have two. So I have leading Legio 1, Decimus Junius Brutus. And then Legio 2, I have Lucius Julius Libo. That's the 
basically the character of the family I'm playing at. So there's four potential families that you can use in the campaign, and I want to get a general in each one so neither one of them feels left out. So we have to recruit someone from the Cornelia family and someone from the Papira family. So we're going to recruit... Let's see here. We're going to recruit Gnaeus Cornelius Scipio Asina of the Gens Cornelia. He will be Legio III. Commander. And then we are going to recruit Lucius Papirius Cursor of the Gens Papiria. He will be Legio IV. And we're going to go through real quick here. And we're just going to eliminate the names of the legions. So Legio I here was called Italica. Legio II up here was called Equestris. Legio III was called Minervia. And Legio IV was called Veneria. Eventually, we're going to review the legions. So, like, we'll review Legio 1, 2, etc. But for now, we're just going to leave them be. So, we've recruited a spy and two governors. We maxed out the number of generals we have on the field. We're now going to look at the army. Ready for orders. So, Legio 2, led by Lucius Julius Libo. He's going to be our spotlight later. For now, we're going to kind of ignore him. But at the moment, we are going to look at the army. He has one unit of Hastati, one unit of Princopes, and one unit of Triarii in his army. He can recruit the following units. Equites, Triarii, Princopes, Hastati, Italici Milites, Rorii, Levies, and Akensii. So the Akensii are Camillan Levy Slingers, the Levies are Camillan Levy Javelinmen, the Rorarii are Camillan Reserve Manipoles, the Italis Chiai Metelis are Italic Levies, and then you have the main three, Astati, Princopes, and Triarii, those are the most well-known professional military units in the Roman army. Then you have the Equites. So as you might have guessed, we are in what's called the Camillan Military Period. Later on, as the game progresses, you can go through different reform periods. One of those being the Polybian reform periods, another one being the Marian reform periods, and then finally the Imperial reform periods. Basically, as you reach enough power and standing, you can research a tech that will reform your military. So here, you'll see that the Hastate, the Princopes, and the Triarii all have spears. Although the Princopes and Hastati are usually known for carrying a short sword, such as the Gladius or the Spatha. Anyways, we're going to re review them real quick so you have an idea of what's going on in my head. So, infantry will make the backbone of my army. Any army I create usually has 5 units of horsemen and 15 units of infantry for a total of well, 5 units of horsemen and 15 units of infantry. The way I play is I try to create a strong line of infantry to march up to the enemy, and that infantry will hold the enemy infantry in place. They don't necessarily need to deal out a whole lot of damage or casualties. What they need to do is they need to not rout and not take damage. That's what they do. Because I'll deploy my cavalry on the wings with some Triarii, and their job is to rout the enemy cavalry, if they have any, and once the enemy cavalry has been chased from the battlefield, use my cavalry to perform flanking and rear charges to cause the enemy to rout. Once the enemy is routing, I can use those available infantry forces to envelop the other infantry forces remaining, and then slowly grind them down slash use repeated cavalry charges to force them to rout. And that's kind of how I play as Rome. That's my entire military strategy. I very rarely change it, and usually it works. So now it breaks down to, do we recruit Hastate? or Princopes. So the Hastati from the early period, they are a Camillan Light Spear Manipole. These young men are the armored front line of a Roman legion, equipped with a spear and a square shield. Then we have the Princopes, the Camillan Heavy Spear Manipole. Wealthy and older Roman citizens, the Princopes are the main heavy infantry force. 
They are armed with spears and large shields like the Stade, but have better armor. And right there, you have just heard the key to what I choose. The Hastade have 20 armor. The Principes, 35 armor. While well, like, not quite double, we're going to round up and call it double. They have double the armor that the Hastade have. Now you might be thinking, okay, so double the armor. The Hastade are only 671 to recruit. The Principes are 882, so they're obviously a lot more expensive, right? Even the Hastade, they cost 139 a turn to upkeep, while the Principes cost 180. Right? That's a 41 denarii difference. In my opinion, that 41 denarii is well worth the additional 15 armor you're going to get. So that's why we go with the Principes. Other than that, the other stats are pretty much identical. Melee attack, melee defense, charge bonus, weapon damage, melee attack penetration damage, the bonus versus the cavalry, infantry, and the elephants. The only major difference is your armor. Your base morale, which only has a slight difference of plus three to the Principes, then the speed, which is the Hastati are just a little bit faster. So that is why the Principes will make up the backbone of my army. The thing is the Hastati and the Principes also both recruit manpower from the plebs, so that's why I choose one or the other. The other units that I had listed, the Italic Levies, the Reserve Manipoles, and the Javelin Men and Slingers, don't even factor in. I don't recruit levy units in my army. I only get a limited number of armies, which is right now I only have four armies I can deploy on the entire battlefield. And each army can only have 20 units, so I'm not going to use levy units in my army. So we're going to use full-time professional Roman soldiers. And that will be the Principes. So we're going to go ahead and recruit a bunch of them. Right now it looks like we can recruit five units per turn. So we recruited five Principes. I'm going to actually take one away. So it's going to be four Principes, and I'm going to add a unit of Equites. So I didn't handle the Triarii and the Equites just yet. We'll talk about them. The Triarii of the early period are a Camillan veteran maniple. Wealthy and experienced citizen soldiers armed with spears and large shields. These men hold their positions in the third line of the Roman Manipolar Legion. Now they have slightly more melee attack, you know, a little bit better defense, charge bonus, little, all of the stats are better than the Principes, but they are also 249 denarii per turn. That is almost 70 more than the Principes. That's a pretty steep difference to go from 41 per turn to 70. On top of that, the Triarii are more specialized. They will carry a spear throughout most of the reform periods. So in the Camillan period, they have a spear. I think in the Pol Polybian and Marius reform periods, they also have a spear. I haven't got that far in the game, so I don't know for sure. I know the Principes will drop the spear for a Gladius or a Spatha. So, you know, we usually have either two to four Triarii in army, the army. I haven't decided just yet, but I usually deploy them on the wings of my infantry with my cavalry. Now, they are a bit slower, so you might think, well, they're more heavily armored and they're more elite. Why don't you put them in the middle so they can hold? Well, I want them to envelop. Remember, we use the cavalry, and then we usually have maybe a triarii or two. If we're on the offense, the triarii really can't chase them down, but where if we're on the defense, the cavalry are going to attack us. I can use those triarii to deploy them where I have my own cavalry, and they have that bonus to cavalry because they have a spear. So their bonus versus cavalry and the elephant are 21. Now, the Principes have a bonus of 17 for the cavalry. However, once they drop their spears and they switch to a sword, they will lose that bonus. Only spear-wielding units have a bonus versus cavalry. So we aren't going to recruit any Triarii for now. We don't really need them. We're, we're okay with the four Principes. And then lastly, we have the Equites, the Camillan Cavalry. The cavalry elite of Roman society, used for flanking and pursuing routing enemies. Equipped with a spear and circular shield, along with the finest armor they can afford. Now, they have less armor, right? Not as much morale, but you can't really com compare them to an infantry unit, because the equites, in my opinion, are the most important part of my army. And Hannibal would say that as well. 
there will be your general's bodyguard and then four units of equites, two on each side. And their job is to neutralize the enemy cavalry. So whatever cavalry the enemy has, I'm going to send my cavalry out to make sure that the enemy cavalry is destroyed. Then once the enemy cavalry has been routed from the battlefield, that means I will control the flow of the battle. The enemy will not have any mobile units that can harass my cavalry, but well, my cavalry can harass their infantry. So as my Princopes and my Triarii are holding the enemy infantry line in place, my Equites will perform either flanking maneuvers or rear charges. And there's nothing more demoralizing than having your infantry held in place and then a cavalry attack smashing them from the side or the back. And that's the goal. I don't want to necessarily murder the entire army. I want to get them to break. And breaking and routing is very important. In the ancient days, there wasn't a whole lot of... I don't want to say there wasn't. Most of the killing came after the battle was over. So when you were engaged in combat, you weren't going too crazy because your life was on the line, right? Just imagine if you're marching yourself up to the enemy and you have to cross a mile and you finally get there and everyone's in formation and there's not many openings. You're not likely to just run in there like you see on the, the movie screens and risk getting killed. But if you're holding them in line and the enemies, you're both fighting and then the, the cavalry appears and you've been flanked, well, you're more likely to run away. And then that is when the massacre occurs. When an enemy unit is running away, they're clearly not defending yourself. So your Princopes, your infantry, can chase them, and then your cavalry can hunt them down. So that that's how I want to do things. I want to make the enemy infantry break. I want to force them to rout, and then as they're routing, hunt them down because they can't deal damage to me. So that's why the Equites, and even the Princopes and Triarii, they all have their role. The Princopes hold the enemy in place, the Triarii aid the cavalry in destroying the enemy cavalry, and then they envelop the enemy's wings, and then the Equites take out the enemy cavalry and then perform charges and then hunt down the enemy. The last thing we're going to review is the General's Bodyguard, Custodes Corporis Legate, Camillan General's Bodyguard. These Roman officers and their guard of equestrians lead the Roman Legion into battle. As you might guess, all their stats are fantastic, uh, much better than the Equites, except for their speed. Equites are a little bit of a lighter cavalry, so they move faster, but they have less armor, attack, etc. But they guard the general. Now, one thing I did neglect to mention is the Triarii and the Equites are also pulled from the Patrician classes, and the Patrician class is much less populated. So that's about it. Uh, something I did also fail to mention is all the infantry that I've recruited, so the Hastade, the Princopes, and the Triarii all have 200 men per unit, while the cavalry only have 100 men per unit. So that is how the game balances out. You don't get a 200-man cavalry force. The cavalry is only a 100-man force. So that covers our armies. You saw why I chose the Princopes over the Hastade. We covered the Triarii and the Equites, and we went over the General's Bodyguard. Now, something else we're going to do is we're going to bop on down here to Legia 1, and we're going to disband his military. They are a bunch of other, basically, units. They aren't the Princope Equite formation that I like, so we're not going to keep them around. And then we are also going to have him recruit two units. Um, two Princopes. The re reason being is because there's a stance here that you guys can't see. Right now, Legio 1 and 2 are called Mustering. They recruit new troops to an army and improve replenishment of diminished units. Minus 2 food in the local region, plus 4% replenishment rate for all units, and plus 7.5% melee defense skill for all units. Eventually, after they've mustered units, they can assume a new stance called the Patrol Stance, which we will review next time. But the Patrol Stance has its own benefits, but the biggest thing is you need three units. So the General's Bodyguard plus two infantry or two, whatever, to basically make that stance available. Now, this is why we declared or sued for peace with Pyros. We went from about 20,000 denarii to start to 19,000 when we made peace, we are now down to 5,422 denarii. That is after recruiting two governors and a spy, two generals, 
six principes and an equites. We went through almost 14,000 denarii. Now we are making 3,605 per turn. Not bad, but that's going to also drop next turn when we have to start paying upkeep for all these units that we just recruited. It's the name of the game though. You have to balance expenditures and income. You'll see we go through periods of rapid expansion where we get a lot of money, but then we need armies, so then that money goes all back into the military. So you can see it kind of does a good job mirroring, well, Rome for the most part. So, we're going to get to our spotlight here in a second. It's going to be on this guy right here. Lucius Libo Julius. Also called Lucius Julius Libo. I haven't showed you the faction tab yet. This tab will be incredibly important. But right now, all you need to know is we have Lucius Julius Libo. He is the primus inter pares which means first among equals. He is the family leader, and like I said, the primus inter pares. So he is the leader of the Julii family, and he is the leader of Rome right now. So Gens Julia, faction leader Lucius Julius Libo, and he is married to Lucretia. We also have five other, what I'm gonna call statesmen. You have Gnaeus Cornelius Scipio Asina, we just recruited him. Lucius Cornelius Scipio, part of the Gens Cornelia. We have Marcus Junius Brutus and Decimus Junius Brutus. Decimus Junius is in control of the Legio I. That is the Gens Junia. Then we have Lucius Papyrus Cursor, part of the Gens Papyria. So you see where we have the Julii family, the Cornelia, the Junia, and the Papyria. I'm not going to go over this tab too much more. Save that for a different time because the faction tab is like 25 minutes to explain it all. And we want to focus on this man right here. So we're going to go over the details of Lucius Julius Libo. Right now he has six authority, three cunning, and three zeal. Now, authority, cunning, and zeal are the main three attributes of a general. These attributes all augment how things go. So you can see authority. A general's strength of character and ability to lead troops into battle. Security against authority-based agent actions. Plus 6% chance of wounding enemy agents in self-defense. Plus 15% to the size of the commander's aura of influence. So I like authority because when we get in our first battle, you'll see he has a larger authority of influence, and troops within his authority of influence get a bonus. Cunning. Now he only has a cunning of three. Three is neutral. Three means you don't have any positive, but you don't have any negative effects. A general's understanding of strategy and tactics. Security against cunning-based actions. And then zeal. A general's resolve and personal combat prowess. Security against zeal-based actions. The way I kind of look at it is authority is your ability to command an army. Cunning is your ability to understand how to deploy your units and then how to deal with the management of an army and the upkeep. And zeal is how good of a fighter you are. So, each general has what I call three base traits and three uh, additional traits that can all be changed. They also have uh, a wife or no wife if you haven't been married three households which are just basically things you can equip to make them better and then they have skills so lucius julius libo he is currently 25 years old he has an ambition of two so ambition represents a character's desire for personal power and glory higher ambition increases the effect that character's gravitas has on their party's influence and then gravitas of 44 Gravitas represents a character's importance and contributes to their party's influence. The higher their gravitas, the higher the chance of increasing this influence. So each political party, right, each family will have a gravitas, and the higher that gravitas, the more seats they hold in the Senate. Now you want to keep the Senate as balanced as possible, or not balanced as possible, if you want to become an empire. That's for a long time down the road. For now, we're in the Republic, we want to keep things balanced. So we'll do our best to keep the Julii, the Cornelia, the Junii, and the Papyria all balanced. So his traits, his first trait, 
Primus inter pares, first among equals, plus two authority, plus four gravitas per turn, plus three influence per turn for the ruling political party, that's faction wide, plus three political public order per turn, local province, minus 8% unit recruitment cost, minus 10% upkeep for all land units, plus 5% melee defense skill for all infantry units, enables the abilities inspire and rally, plus 15% tax rate in the local province, and plus 10 loyalty for the political party this character belongs to. So you can see being the primus inter pares is all positive things. He is also an industrialist. Education and upbringing are the foundations of character. It unlocks the ability to reach the higher tier of intellectual trait industrial magnet. And then plus 10% wealth from industry in the local province and minus 5% wealth from agriculture in the local province. That one doesn't affect me very much. I don't really have many industrial buildings to generate wealth. So kind of lost on him, but it is what it is. And lastly, philosophic. Cultured, pedantic, and cowardly. Plus 10% research rate. Unlocks the ability to reach the higher tier intellectual trait renowned philosopher. And then, not good things. Minus 20% chance of successfully launching an ambush. Army only. Good thing is I don't use ambushes. Minus 8% morale for all units during offensive battles. That one's bad. He does a lot of offensive battles, and having an 8% morale hit is not good. Plus 20% wealth from culture, local province. Kinda is what it is. Now, those are the three base traits. Those are ones where, I don't want to say he's born with them, but those are like your core traits. Now, primus inter pares, you can't change much, but industrialist and philosophic, remember he can kind of advance to the next level if... He grows them properly. Now we're going to have the three other traits. These are traits that you can change a lot easier. So he's a scrapper, type brawler. How to increase, low bodyguard casualties, victories, and age. How to decrease, high bodyguard casualties. Mediocre, plus 1% melee attack skill for the commander's unit, plus 1% melee defense skill for the commander's unit, minus 1% morale for the commander's unit. What this means is, as he fights battles, if he has a low bodyguard casualty count, he wins and he grows older, that bonus will increase. If a lot of his bodyguard dies, this bonus will decrease. His second one is deputy type commander. How to increase low casualties, victories, and age. How to decrease high casualties. Clueless but learning. As you can guess from that, that's not good. He has minus 5% campaign map movement range, plus 3% upkeep for all land units, and minus 1% morale for all units during battles in foreign territory. So those are three very negative effects. Now, if he can fight battles and have a low casualty account, he can win and he grows older, those might become positive. The last one is student, type intellectual. How to increase, be in a province with high public order, have governor skills or age, how to decrease, be in a province with low public order. Stay silent and listen, minus one growth per turn, plus one cultural conversion in the local province, and plus one percent tax rate. The growth per turn kinda hurts, the cultural conversion kinda helps, but that one's kinda neutral for the most part. The big one was the deputy type commander, where he has less movement range, less upkeep, or more upkeep for his units, and less morale in the field. Now remember, he's also married to his wife, Lucretia. So Lucretia is an efficient wife. Within these doors, I run the household. You have enough with everything else. She grants plus one authority, plus two loyalty for marriage, and plus two chance to having children. His base skill is also Felicitas. I do only what any good Roman would. Minus 10% city center building construction costs, local province, and plus 5% wealth from all commerce, local province. Pretty good, but he's going to be a military commander, so it'll help where he is, but it's not huge. Now, I do also want to review his wife because he is married. So, Lucretia also has a household in traits, so we can see what type of husband he is. So, he is a gifted husband. Some are born more capable than others, attributes and all. Plus two zeal, plus one loyalty for marriage, 
and plus 4% wealth from culture. So she has an authority of 3, a cunning of 3, a zeal of 5, 25 gravitas, 2 ambition, and she is 19 years old. Her traits are industria. This woman works hard during every hour the gods grant her, plus 1 growth per turn in the local province. Influential women. Women are not supposed to influence politics in Rome, yet they still do. Plus 1 gravitas per turn plus 3% wealth from entertainment, that's culture in all the regions, and plus 2 loyalty for the political party this character belongs to. She's also a traitor. Education and upbringing are the foundations of character, plus 2% wealth from all commerce in all regions. Those are her three base traits. Now, she has one more trait, plus 2 open spots available that she could develop. So she's philosophic. Disciplined, confident, cowardly, generous. Plus 3% research rate, Minus 1% Empire Maintenance, plus 2 Gravitas per turn, minus 5 to chance of having children, and plus 2 loyalty for the political party this character belongs to. You can see in her career she is an influential woman, that's the plus 3% wealth from the entertainment culture in all regions, plus 1 Gravitas per turn, and the plus 2 loyalty. So she can advance up the rank to basically 3, so she can go from influential woman, to opportunistic woman, to power hungry woman, to matron. Because he's the Primus Inter Pares, he doesn't really get any promotions. He's already at the top of his career because he is the Primus Inter Pares. You'll see on the side here, there's also what they call intrigues, and that's just basically faction stuff. Um, the best way I can describe this game is... The military is fun, yet easy, if you do it right. That brings up something good. We need to change the battle difficulty. So remember, our battle difficulty is on very hard right now. We're going to put it on normal. So remember, DEI is designed around a normal battle difficulty. If you recall, if we are on hard or very hard, the enemy units get huge bonuses. And I'm not trying to fight levy units that are stronger than my main units. I'm happy fighting a balanced campaign. My map difficulty is already on very hard, so we'll keep that there. So not only does very hard influence the campaign map, you know, how the other factions, you know, like the Ligurians over here or the Venetians handle, but it also influences your faction tab. Once again, we won't go into the faction tab, but in the future, probably about a third, if not half of your money goes towards that faction tab. Like, yes, you'll use your money to recruit troops and to build buildings, but ideally you don't want to lose any troops and have to waste more money on them and you want to only build buildings once and then be done because your faction tab starts to really blow up especially as the empire gets big bigger and you accrue what's called imperium it gets a lot harder to control so that was about lucius julius libo in game let's talk about lucius julius libo irl so our spotlight on Lucius Julius Libo. He was Consul of Rome from 267 to 266 BCE, serving with Marcus Attilius Regulus. He will also make an appearance down the road, but not quite yet. He was a senator and military commander from the Gens Julii, a prominent patrician family. So what was he known for? Well, right now he's recruiting an army and he's going to head up to Aretium and take that next turn. But what he was known for was actually carrying out a war against the Salentini, a Mesopian group of people of Apulia. So Apulia is the heel of Italy. This area right here I'm circling, sorry for those of you that can't see it, would be called Apulia. It is the heel of Italy and then it goes a little bit north towards Beneventum, but not quite. It's just the heel. So anyone that knows, you know, like a high heel stud, that's what you're looking at. Now, he conquered the city of Brundisium. And this is where, as much as I love DEI, I take issues with certain things. You can see the heel here has the city of Terrace on it. Now, Terrace was the name of the city founded by Greeks those Greeks being the Spartans, actually founded this colony, and they called it Terrace. Eventually, the Romans conquered Terrace, and they renamed it to Tarentum. That would be 
something you know. And then that is modern day Toronto in Italy. Now, I don't agree with Terrace being placed here. Now, I could be wrong. I've been wrong many times in my life. But from what I know, Terrace was not on the... How do I say this? The eastern part of the heel. Terrace should be more down here in the western slash southern part, like where the heel comes into the bottom of that foot, where that bay is. That's where I thought Tarentum was located. Where Terrace currently is, I thought was the city of Brundisium, modern day Brindisi. The reason I bring that up is because Lucius Julius Libo and Marcus Attilius Regulus, they are both known because they conquered the city of Brundisium in Toronto. Well, where Toronto is, or Terrace. We'll stick with the old names, Terrace. So, Brunisium is actually located where the city of Terrace is, and Terrace should be on the other end of the heel. So, maybe DEI got it wrong. Maybe I'm getting it wrong. I don't know. Look up a map of ancient Rome, but I think Brunisium should be where Terrace is, and Terrace should move over. Now, because there's so few cities in the game, maybe they just thought Tarentum was a more important city, so they just stuck it in this province. But, I don't know. I thought it should be Brundisium. So both Lucius Julius Libo and Marcus Attilius Regulus were no awarded a triumph for their conquering of Brundisium. So, as you know, the Julii were a prominent patrician class, but the last major Julii to appear in the historical record was Gaius Julius, his dictatorship in 352 BCE. And then the next famous to appear would be Gaius Julius Caesar of the Kaiser branch of the Julii family. So Libo is probably a link between the Julii of the early Republic and the Julii Caesars who came later during the Second Punic Wars to the founding of Imperial Rome. So remember you have the Julii, they are the main family, but the Caesars kind of become like a branch family. There's not much else known about him or his family. Now there's some relatives that he could link to, but it's kind of sketchy at best, so we're just not gonna we're not gonna talk about it. All you need to know is that he was consul from 267 to 266. He served with Marcus Atlius Regulus, and he conquered Brundisium in Apulia. And that I take issue with where the city of Terrace is, because I think that's where the city of Brundisium is, and that Terrace should move over. If I ever do a playthrough of Rome. Total War. It also has sparse cities like this, but I use a mod that adds a ton of cities to the game. So if I ever do that, you'll see maybe I'll be right, maybe I'll be wrong. Who knows? As you can potentially hear a helicopter flying by my house. Anyways, can't control that, and we're gonna just deal with it. So that's Lucius Julius Libo. The last thing we're going to do before we end the turn, yes, I promise, starting next episode we will end the turn, is we are going to construct some buildings. So what do we construct? Well, Beneventum and Cosentia aren't a complete province yet, so we're going to kind of leave them alone for the time being. We're also going to do something crazy, and we're going to untax that province. Now that will go from minus 17 to minus 10 public order per turn very manageable. Instead of rebelling in, you know, six turns, now they'll rebel in ten turns. On top of that, we are going to lose some money. We're going to lose 472 per turn, but you know what? That's okay. We can, we can be okay with that. Now, in Latium, we have the city of Rome, and Ariminum, and Ascalum. We are actually going to go on a brief purge here. And we're going to destroy a bunch of buildings. So we're going to convert or dismantle the villa in Ariminum. We are going to dismantle the consecrated ground in Ascalum. And we are going to develop land in Beneventum. And then Beneventum we are going to build a consecrated ground. So, why a consecrated ground? Well, consecrated ground. 
tread carefully to all those who enter. This is basically the first building in a building chain that builds temples. But the main region, reason we're building it is because it will give us plus two sanitation in the region. We'll have 2% regional income tax. That's taxes for building the upkeep, so we lose 2% income. We'll get a plus two Latin cultural influence and a plus 0.1% first and second class citizens. Well, we have an issue. We have no sanitation in either of our cities, but we have one squalor. So that means we have a 1% risk of plague. I want to get rid of that by building the consecrated ground. On top of that, we'll also get the two Latin per turn. So we will be able to convert the populace there to Latin faster. Remember, we are at 0% Latin in Magna Gratia. It is 50% Italic and 50% Hellenic. Now, in the spirit of being a podcast, since you guys can't read everything, I am going to be reading for you. So, across Roman territory, consecrated ground with space dedicated to a religious purpose and given over to worship, prayer, and often sacrifice. In fact, the Latin word templum actually refers to not a building, but a sacred outdoor space where a religious structure might be constructed. Maintaining good relations with the gods was an essential part of everyday life for people who had different god watching over them for every given circumstance. There were shrines in every home and community, and consecrated grounds such as springs and groves and temples were found everywhere. Up to a third of the official Roman year was dedicated to celebrating religious festivals, so shrines were well-used spaces. They were considered so important that to desecrate such places was a sacrilege punishable by death. So sacrilege or consecrated grounds are the first step. Now this consecrated ground won't stay here permanently. It's just going to hang out for now because we just want to push Roman culture or Latin culture and get a little bit of sanitation. The way that I try to set up most of my cities, just to give you an idea, is I put the temple, the main temple in this, the city I call it. So Rome is the capital of Latium. So the temple will go in there and then the other offshoot cities, right? The smaller cities will be dedicated to making money as well as other stuff, but that'll be explained down the line so that's about it we have two buildings that we are deconstructing in latium we have one building we are building in magna gratia and we have 3802 denarii with 3133 coming in next turn and a surplus of seven food and that my friends will finally do it for turn one it took two episodes but it's done. We're good. Next turn, oh, look forward to us finally clicking that famous end turn button at the bottom, and then sending Legio 2 up, led by Lucius Julius Libo, to attack the city of Aretium. As always, thanks for tuning in. I appreciate all your support, and I look forward to next time. Have a good one.